evening. I'm Meg Gray. I'm a science and technology librarian here, and I'm one half of the, uh, the, the two of us that organize this series. So we're here every fourth Wednesday of the month for Portland Sustainability Series. And unfortunately, I'm just Burton, who's the executive director of the Maine Conservation Collaborative, could not be here tonight. But that is a great organization, and they have been an incredible partner um, for the series. And I believe this is our 14th, so I'm pretty excited that we're um, continuing to move on. Um, tonight, we have two gentlemen speaking about the solar panel array that is on the roof of the library. And if it were a better evening, I would invite you to take a look at it. But if you're ever in the library during the day, if you take the elevator to the third floor, you have a great view of our solar array up on the roof. So I encourage you to do that sometime. Um, Rocky Ackroyd is the founder and owner of Green Sun LLC, a company that installs solar energy systems and is committed to promoting renewable energy technology through community outreach. Rocky collaborated with PPL to install an 8,000 watt solar array to demonstrate the feasibility of solar photovoltaic systems. In addition, he developed the solar outreach to schools, which is a, mo a mobile solar trailer, which is very cool, you should check out on his website, designed to teach math and science to high school students and communities all related to solar energy. And Peter Chevenel is the co-director of the Spillway Fund, an organization that seeks to help preserve and protect the natural environment of southern and mid-coast Maine by promoting clean energy, supporting sustainable agriculture, and encouraging a passion for the area's unique natural heritage through arts residencies and education. So I have some involvement in this project, mostly for the educational components as a librarian, but I'm going to introduce Randy Creswell. He's the chair of Perkins Thompson's Bankruptcy Creditor and Debtor Rights Practice Group. Phew, what a title. And he served, <laughs> he served on Portland Public Library's Board of Directors since 2009, and he's now the board's president. So thank you, Randy. He's going to give us um, some information about PPL's vision. So thank you for coming. I know it's a, a smaller crowd, so we'll be a little more probably formal and hopefully be able to have some back and forth and dialogue. I mean, I think ideally the gentleman will give their presentation with their questions, so feel free to ask it. Um, uh, I guess from the, from the library's perspective, and I wouldn't say that we were actively going down this road until we really partnered with the Spillway folks and they, they kind of raised our consciousness about sustainability and introduced the idea of the solar panels um, Group. And we're right now, the library is a bit of a transition period because I believe in 2009 or 2010, I can't recall exactly, uh, is when we just did the renovation for the main building. And we are quite removed from that now. And the board is really thinking about what's the next step? Uh, what are we going to do as a library? And whether it's um, more infrastructure for the physical plants and the like, but also how can we? How can we really follow on the concept of sustainability? I mean, a lot of the ideas and designs for the first first iteration of the library, we're going to have a, perhaps like a green roof and have outdoor space on the roof here so that folks could go out and enjoy sort of those views and, and use that more as a community place. And we're still really exploring that. And just I just think that uh, spillway involvement has really has been an accelerant for those kinds of ideas. And so that's where the library is moving, is trying to get a, get a good handle on it. And the project that we did with Spillway that involved um, Rocky Ackroyd, um, putting the solar panels out here, we're going to have educational stuff that, that ties in with the panels. You've got, you got an array out there that will be probably consistent for a single family residence, so you get a sense of what kind of power we generate with that. Obviously, it doesn't do much for a giant facility like this. But the idea is to put a, perhaps a kiosk somewhere accessible downstairs where folks can go see, me measure how much power that's generating. It will translate into what it would be like if you had it at your house and what kind of savings and environmental benefits you get over that first period of time. So the educational component is, is very important to the library. And so we're grateful for the introduction of that to, uh, to us. And so that's all I really want to say in terms of what Board's doing. There's a consciousness now about where the library is going and how we can fit into this sort of conversation. Um, Peter, I don't know if you were going to go first. And, and, yeah. So this is Peter Shevinov, the Spillway Fund. Been 
one of the more visionary folks I've met in quite some time. So I appreciate you. Thank you very much. That's great. Hello, thanks for coming and joining us tonight. We're excited that this has finally come to uh, fruition. We're still working on the educational piece, but the solar panels are up. They are plugged in. We are generating power right now. And you'd be surprised how long it took us to get to this point for what's a relatively simple project. Um, but there were a lot of ins and outs along the way. Um, but first, I want to thank Randy and the Board of Trustees and Sarah Campbell, the Library's Director, and her team for being really inspiring partners in all this. Um, we've got a couple more projects that are going to work together, so hopefully this is just the beginning of a lot of great stuff to come. I want to thank Meg as well, not only for putting this uh, lecture series together, but um, for developing the educational piece that we're going to hear about a little bit in just a moment. Um, so I'm here as co-director of the Spillway Fund. It's an organization that started three years ago with a friend of mine, John Scully, who grew up in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, went off to see the world and we kind of came back a few years ago and wanted to do something to give back to our home area. So we started this organization to do things in the areas we're most interested in, the environment and the arts. As fate would have it, the environment guy is on a plane to Amsterdam right now. So you've got the arts guy here to talk about uh, science stuff, which I'm going to not do. I'm going to pass that down to Rocky, because he's more than capable of it. Um, in just a moment, what I will talk about is the stuff I do know something about, just how we got here. Um, and that's something that might be of interest to you. Um, it's kind of the essence behind a spillway fund, the way we look at the environmental piece, which is our simple idea is this, that the environment should be something we can all get on. So whatever side of the political aisle you're on, we all like clean air. I think we all can agree on the value of energy independence from foreign oil. And I think we all want a clean environment for our kids and grandkids to grow up in. So it should be something we can all, we can all uh, get behind. Um, that said, that future isn't going to come about um, if we wait for the stars to align in Augusta, or if we wait for the market forces to make it suddenly uh, desirable um, for this to happen. If it's going to happen, it's going to have to happen because of all of us who benefit from it, which pretty much everybody. Um, so that's our idea, um, that we are a very small organization, we have very modest resources, um, so we thought we would start small by filling every roof in Portland with solar panels. Uh, small resources, big dreams. Right, so we're kind of like the proverbial ant trying to move a proverbial boulder, right? It's only going to work if the boulder happens to be at the edge of a precipice anyways. You get all the other ants to push. You get the wind in your back, and then you need like a bolt of lightning to hit the boulder and just push it right off the edge. So we started by going to City Hall and with the mayor. We thought maybe Mayor Strimlin could be our bolt of lightning. Turns out that's not in his portfolio. Uh, but what he did do, he did this one better. He said, um, why don't you guys start with one building? And why don't you talk to Sarah? And we did it. The rest is, is history in the making. And as we all were working on this project, and we went through the different possibilities and to see what we could make happen, we, um, we came across our own relation to this one notion that, about what is the, um, the factor that is the, the biggest factor in someone's decision to go solar for their home. Does anyone have a guess of what that is? What is the, the tipping point that makes someone say, hey, I want to do this in my house? Cost. The cost, the guess. The, the answer I'm looking for is your neighbor does it. That's the number one thing that, that you see in all people go solar. That's the, the big uh, uh, common thread. And what that means, it's not just you're doing it because you're keeping up with the Joneses, it's because you can ask the questions that we're going to be able to ask Rocky tonight. Um, what is the cost? How long will it pay for itself? How much energy will it produce? What do you do on a cloudy day? What is net meter? All these things. When your neighbor is there, you can go back and forth. You decide, hey, maybe that's for me. So um, we also realized we were sitting in uh, this building here, which because of its location in the center of town and the fact that 600,000 people walk through the doors every year, in a way, the library is everybody's neighbor. So we had an opportunity, we realized, if we created a size a solar array about the size of what we have on a household on the roof here, and we're able to get the information to people, 
we could be everyone's neighbor, everyone saw our neighbor. So our goals are twofold. One is to provide that information to people so homeowners and business owners who come to the library can get the information to decide if solar is right for them. But also to get it in front of the homeowners and business owners of tomorrow. A ton of students walk to this library. And between the solar project and hopefully there are more renewables and future projects baked into the library to become part of their DNA, the way the millennials grew up with recycling as part of everything they think about, the way Gen Xers like me grew up with no seatbelts, no, the way we grew up with um, uh, uh, it was lit litter is our issue. So we had that, some of you remember the ad of the Indian chief with the tear and all the litter. So we were getting our parents and grandparents to throw things away from the library. Millennials won't print anything. They're really savvy about recycling. Um, we we're hoping that tomorrow's, today's young people, tomorrow's leaders will grow up knowing the stuff that we're about to hear about tonight just because they've been around it all the time. Um, and with the help like, from people like Rocky, I think we're going to get there. Um, with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Rocky. Um, we're probably going to have plenty of time for Q&A, so any questions you have about that, any questions you have, or actually thoughts, if you have any thoughts for me in terms of um, helping us move that boulder, uh, uh, any way to find them. Um, public involvement making these things happen. Love to hear about it. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and thank you for everybody for coming. Um, it's a small crowd, so I really want to just uh, say that uh, anybody who has any questions along this whole thing, just raise your hand, stop me, and, and ask questions. Very, very informal. Uh, thank you uh, for Portland Public Library and the, all the people involved for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Um, I loved working with the Portland, as a collaborator with the Portland Public Library to do this project. Part of my, my DNA is to really kind of um, push renewable energy and from ways that go back into my high school days to a certain extent with littering and, and recycling, uh, even before it was vogue um, from, from my perspective. I think your point at um, generational sort of changes that are accepted um, as commonplace, um, things like recycling was something that really didn't happen when I was a kid. And again, it's something that's expected and it's part of the daily life. Uh, solar and other sorts of renewables coming forward are gonna be part of this next generation. And again, forums like this are great ways of getting this going. Um, this is the sun. Uh, this is like a, a one day, uh, a, you know, a time lapse from like 14 days from 1914, uh, excuse me, 2014. Um, we're just kind of recording the sun and it's one complete rotation. The amount of energy in the sun is incredible. We're only just getting a teeny, teeny, tiny fraction that's hitting the Earth as it's coming from the sun. It's going in three to 660 degrees in all other directions. And it's been here for millions of years and it's gonna be here for millions more. So this is an incredible resource that uh, we can do much better at, at tapping. Sure. How far away is the sun from the Earth? I'm not gonna answer that other than say it's really far. Uh, that's probably well, something. Well, it's a long way away, you know, to cause all this, you know, life on Earth, 90 million miles away. Yeah, it's incredible, uh, the amount of power that the sun has, especially at its distance. Um, this is the solar array that we put here on the, on the library. Again, the goal was to have a solar array which is pretty similar to something a household would be. This array is around uh, 8,235 watts. I'm going to jump quickly to the day that we did a lot of the construction. There you go. So um, my crew of about four or five people came with a crew of about four or five people from the library. And in pretty much on a kind of a cloudy, little chilly day, we were able to get this whole system up and running, or not up and running, but at least installed onto the roof. Um, and we all took part in it, both volunteers and some of my crew. It goes a lot faster when you're, when you're doing it as a time lapse. This is the actual dashboard for the solar system here at the library. And what it does, it records on a daily basis all the energy that's produced on a daily basis and kind of keeps track of it from one month to the next. Uh, this was actually installed uh, and started collecting data at the beginning of September. Uh, so this is what we've seen in terms of production on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, about 45 kilowatt hours on that particular day. In the summer, it might get up to 50 or 60. Um, or 70, really, again, you're going to have a much greater production during the summer than you will uh, during the winter. It's actually pretty dramatic uh, in some of the changes. I'll even show you on another site. 
So this is the recordings uh, for the first two months. But another site that I have solar on, uh, it's the Comfort Inn in Portland. This is going to show you the, kind of the typical year-to-year -year curves. It's been up and running for two years, and you'll see in January and February, it's really not going to be producing as much as it, you know, it produces almost three times as much in the summer, which is why net metering is so important because you design a system in the course of a year to cover your annual needs, but you're going to be producing most of that annual um, um, energy in the summer months. So in the summer, you're going to be producing excess credits that go to the net or to CMP, and you get those credits um, and start using them in the winter. And if you size the system correctly, you should be just about zero by the end of the year. So this is kind of a typical sort of right. solar curve. Yes? Um, why, why does it produce more in the summer than it has nothing to do with heat, unless maybe it does? Um, the length of the day. Oh, in the winter, basically when you're designing a solar system in, in Maine, you base it on an average of 4.5 sun hours per day over the course of the year. You might get 10 hours of sun in the winter, in the summer, and only two or three in the, in the winter of useful sun hours. So it kind of just evens it out. Plus you also maximize the, the, ex, the, the angle that the sun is with the, um, with the roof if possible. You can't do that in all cases, but you can in, in many. So, enough of the preliminaries. So, what my talk is really going to be s focusing on mostly is some of the technical, how, does, how, do we get, how do we get power from the sun? So, here's our sun. How do we get it to come out of that outlet? And there's lots of parts that go in between. Uh, the first piece is uh, solar modules. And what solar modules have are solar cells within them. Each one of these little squares is one of these little solar cells which produces about maybe about one volt of energy. And solar panels usually come in either 60 or 72 cells. And depending upon the quality of the cells and the size of the panels, um, you're going to have different panels that will be able to give you different amounts of energy. Um, things have gotten better technologically. Um, 20 years ago or 10 years ago, an average size panel might be 150 or 180 watts. Right now, we, uh, there are modules out there of the same size, producing 300 to 350. So the next piece of, of uh, the basic part, and I don't want to get all physics on you guys, but basically when sun hits or light hits a particular type of metal, it will release electrons, which will go from a cathode to the anode. And in silicon, which is these are silicon solar cells, that's exactly what's happening. You're pushing some electrons from this side to that side, and what those electrons want to do is go from, you know, there's too much on the P side, which is a lot of extra electrons. They want to get back to the other side. So if you put a light bulb in between here, you can take advantage of the energy that the electrons have when they want to get back to the other side. So you're giving them a path to get back to the initial uh, spot. Um, that's all I'm going to get into into the physics of it. But, when we have um, solar panels, what we basically have is a power that's coming out is DC. I'm not sure if everybody's heard of DC power versus AC power, but solar panels are just like a battery. They've got a plus side and a minus side. Um, in order to get power to come out of an outlet, it has to be AC. And that's where the inverter comes in. Um, solar panels, again, DC uh, alternating current for, for panels. So once you've got the solar module that's producing the DC power, it goes to the inverter, the inverter is changing it to AC, well, how do you get to your outlets? Well, that's where the installation comes in and you need to be able to connect to your service panel, your circuit breaker box in your home. So I talked about it gets high in the summer and low in the winter. If you have all that extra electricity, um, if you don't have a place to store it, and right now with net metering, the grid is that storage system. It's, it's literally a battery. I'd say it's almost a free battery. It costs you like $12 a month to be hooked up to the grid. Um, so you're able to, to, any energy that's not being used at the home is being put onto the grid um, as, uh, as a credit for later on in the winter when you might need it, or even at nighttime, because you're not having any solar power during the day, during the evenings. I have another question. Sure. Does the all power that's generated by the installation go into the grid, or does it go into your own system and then it's just spill over the grid if there's extra. It's pretty much that way. It spills over. Again, you're, if... Actually powering your own 
appliances and everything with your own power. And then if there's extra, it goes into the grid. For the most part, that's how it works. Um, there's, there's, if you're looking at the meters as electricity is being produced, you'll see um, that, like, first thing in the morning, you're gonna be, your meter's going to be turning because of CMP and it's just getting power off the grid. As your sun starts hit, hit, hitting the, the modules, you're going to start seeing the, the, your power starting to, or the CMP power starting to diminish, and your power is going to start to go up. Um, some, of, um, some of the solar monitoring systems, like the one I showed you, uh, actually can show some active changes. This particular software didn't, the one that's here at the library, but um, there are different ways of doing it, but that is, in essence, correct. Um, so it goes back onto the electric meter, then gets back onto the grid, and then that's your, your basically your free, it, a battery that costs you like $12 a month to just be hooked up. Okay, so the basics of PV photovoltaics is the main components are going to be solar panels um, for making the DC power, the inverters for converting DC to AC. Um, the racking system, you've got to put this, the system on something. You can't just throw it on the roof. It's going to be um, uh, secured. And then there's a whole series of electrical supplies, wire, conduit, hardware, sealants to make sure your roof doesn't leak, a whole slew of different things. So that's really what goes on to a typical uh, PV installation. So you get your solar panels, up on, solar panels up on the roof. They come down to the inverter, which could be in your basement, could be outside, um, whatever's the most convenient or aesthetic, depending upon um, the customer's or the homeowner's choice. Then it goes, the power, the AC power goes, DC power to here, AC power goes to the uh, circuit breaker box, and then it gets distributed to all your outlets in the house. But anything excess goes off to the meter and then off to the grid. So this is the question everybody wants to know. How much does it cost? Well, it really kind of depends upon your variables. How much electricity you use? Do you have, um, um, can you actually put a, a system on your roof? Do you have southern exposure? Do you have trees? Do you have enough space on your property for a ground mount installation? And really, depending upon all those different characteristics, um, you're going to have a system which is going to either be bigger or little, and that's really going to affect the cost. So when we talk about cost for systems, we, we usually talk about the cost per watt installed. So if you put down like a, a 10,000 watt system at $2.20 a watt, it's going to be $22,000. Um, if you're using a ground mount system, which might cost a little bit more, it'll be like $29,000. Um, so I'll get into some of those details. Actually, right here is a great example. Um, here's a typical flat roof mount. Uh, there's two or three different ways of doing it, but this is a racking system that holds the panels with cement blocks onto the roof. And this is more expensive than, than some of the others, or, or our typical rooftop, at around $2.70 a watt, which is what the cost for this particular installation was. Um, for the homeowner paying taxes, um, so $21,000 would be the cost of that system, but with the current tax incentives from the federal government, you get 30% back of that. So you realize cost is only about fourteen seven, And if you calculate the amount of the energy that it will produce in the course of a year, your simple payback is around 10, almost 11 years. You go to something like a ground mount system, um, a ground mount system, because you don't have any structure at all to start off with, you really need to kind of build things from scratch. And there are several different ways of doing it. Pole mount, cement, there, there are different variables, and it depends. Do you have ledge? If you have ledge, you really can't drive posts. So those sorts of things are going to influence the cost. Um, so on a high end, you might say that uh, a ground mount might be 290 a watt. So an 8,000 watt system with a ground mount would be 23,000. After tax credit, um, it would be 16000 and pay back around 12 years. So the best way of going is if you already have a structure, which is your home, and that structure, the roof of your home actually faces south, um, you can get that price down because you, all you need to do is have a racking system as opposed to a whole structure at the same time. So $2.30 a watt is probably in, the good, in a ballpark of, of what something like that should cost these days. If I was to install this system, I actually installed this system in 2013, and it was around $18,000 then, which was $3 a watt. And that's because the price of uh, modules have come down significantly in the last uh, three or four years. That may be changing with the tariffs that may go into effect with the, under the current administration. Uh, I, we can talk about that if you're, more interest, if you're interested later on. 
Uh, but in any case, uh, solar systems, uh, this is going to pay itself back in about nine, uh, nine to ten years. Uh, but solar systems should be expected to last 25 to 30 years. So you're going to have, you're basically paying for all your electricity in one year for the next 25 to 30 years. Um, and the return on investment, if you look at those numbers overall, um, an 18 or basically a $12,000 investment will probably have a return on an investment in 30 years of like maybe $20,000. So you're actually making money. You know, there's, you know, it, to spend, in essence, $12,000 on a solar system is something that pays you back. You know, you buy cars for twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars, and they never pay you back. They only keep costing you. So again, it's a good justification from a, from a, even a financial economic perspective. You just need to have the capital up front in order to to uh, get it installed. Um, there's one other type of racking system, which is uh, solar trackers, and these are very cool, and they they will basically stay perpendicular to the sun all day long, and they usually produce about. 40 or about 40 percent more electricity from the same amount of panels. However, the racking systems cost about at least the same amount as a, a, a as a solar system. So you're better off spending the extra money on more panels, and you'll have something that's not going to have mechanical failures, breakdowns, things like that. So even though the place that I would recommend a solar track, a tracker is if you have a very small piece of property, and you want to maximize whatever you can. Um, that's really, and, and you have maybe some extra money to spend for it because it is, it is much more cost effective. You know, it'll cost you more for the racking than it will for everything else. Um, in terms of production, there's a, a, a program called PV Watts. Um, with this PV Watts calculator, um, this is right online. I can even go here right now. We can just go through the motions. I'd put in, I'm on, on for 106 for the Portland area. And so we're putting up an 8,000 watt system on a typical home. Uh, most panels are going to be standard. I wouldn't put anything uh, premium. Um, and then is it a roof mount like uh, that home or is it open rack like on top of the library? Well, let's just go for the perspective of home. Let's say it's a roof mount versus the others of the tracking. Are they tracking in both directions? Or are they tracking in two different directions, both following the sun this way and also following the sun up and down? Um, but again, a typical home is going to have that. Um, system losses, it defaults in 14%. I usually put it at 20% because I'd rather under-promise and over-deliver than make it so if there was a bad cloudy summer and it didn't produce as well as I said it should, I'd rather you be happy that it's producing more. Um, and then the degree. Basically, the best angle for, the, for solar panels in, in the state of Maine is right around 35 degrees. Um, you're going to be maximizing those sun hours in the summer and producing as much electricity as you can then. Um, so I usually put 35, well, again, you're, you're, if you're building a new home, make your, your roof around 35 degrees. Um, if, you, if you already have an existing home, you really can't control that. Um, and how close to the south are you? Are you 180 degrees south? Um, or you're a little bit off. So long as you're within like 20 degrees, it's going to affect the production maybe around three, four, five percent. Once you get starting to get closer to east and west, you might start losing 10 or 11 percent. So again, a southern exposure is best. New construction, it makes so much sense to be making these decisions right up front. Um, and we'll say residential, and the cost for residential is about 13 cents a kilowatt hour right now. And you just press the button, and it gives you um, the, the, the basic consumption or the production. So I'll take, when I'm trying to figure out what the payback period is, I'm going to say this is going to, it's going to produce around 10,000 kilowatt hours a year, and it's going to save me about $1,300 a year. So I'll take that $1,300, and I'll, um, I'll take that $1,300 and divide it into the 12,000 it cost me to figure out, well, it's going to be about 9.6 years to pay back. And then I'll say if it's going to be a 30-year-old system, then I can say, well, we've got $1,300 times another uh, 20.4 years. Um, 1,300 times 20.4 years. So you'd have a return on investment of $26,000 after, 
so many years. And again, that's going to increase even further as the price of electricity goes up. As the price of electricity goes up, um, your uh, payback goes down and your return on investment goes down. Rocky, yes. Um, since it's such a long-term thing and there is some, some, some dollars involved in the payback, when you're talking about 30 years, what do you see with people who sell their home? You, do you have any idea? What, does that get worked into the... That's still, talking to some real estate people, I asked that question, and it doesn't seem to be helpful or a deterrent one way or the other. One place it is a deterrent, though, is um, SolarCity, um, which is Elon Musk company, uh, that are, they're basically putting solar panels on all over, the, all over the country, and they own the system. It co doesn't cost the homeowner anything to put them up. But they, and then they end up paying solar city for the cost of the electricity. So they're getting solar panels, they're paying for the electricity, but they're doing it in a green way. Problem with that is when somebody's selling the house, there are some problems with, well, I don't want these solar panels on my house, and I don't want to have a relationship with uh, solar city or Elon Musk or Tal uh, um. So there are some issues that have come up when, you, when the homeowner doesn't actually own the panels. But in general, um, I, think it's, um, I think it's about even right now, I think as the millennials and the younger people start becoming, this is part of their life and part of the ways we should be moving forward, um, it's going to be more of a, um, a benefit. Okay, so if you want to figure out how much it's going to cost for you to put up a, a solar system, um, basically what you want to do is go to your CMP, be able to multiply your annual use by 1.25, by 365, by four, uh, divide by 4.5 hours a day. So here's your central main power bill. And this is what you want to look at. Down at the bottom here, uh, you'll see that these are actually 13 months. So just take 12 of the months. You know, cut off either the 417 or the 416. Add up all those numbers down below. And that's how much electricity you use in the course of a year. Okay, at least one particular year. Then you take that, that number, multiply it by 1.25, um, and you get 9,028. Why is that 1.25? Um, because what you're doing is you're taking care of losses, because there's, there's going to be some losses whenever you put the system up. Um, it just, it's, it's just a, a good number to be able to get you to the right size system for an annual, annual use. So you take that kilowatt hours um, from the losses uh, over the entire year divided by 365. So 24.7 kilowatt hours is the average electricity you use in the course of a day. Well, as I said, solar systems are based on, at least in the state of Maine, 4.5 average sun hours per day. So you divide um, 24.7 by 4.5, um, and you get um, what do we have? Got, that should be 5.4, sorry. 5.4 kW as opposed to 5,000 watts. It's the same thing. Um, or multiply that by uh, 10, you get 24,000. So in any case, you would need a 5.4 kW system. The library here is 8.0 or 8.23 kW system. So if you need a system that's 5.5 kW, let's just multiply it by one, uh, about $2.50 a watt. Your system for that house is going to be around $13,000. After you take away the tax credit, it's going to be about $9,600. Again, these are ballparks. Things can change depending upon your home. Things can change if you're facing them more west than south. If you've got trees that are causing shading, this is kind of the perfect situation. And also, if you've got an electrical system that's old and has to be modified, other costs can come through. But in a, in a typical situation, that's what it would cost for, for um, probably a small ranch. Um, and this is just um, showing that if you put those exact same numbers through uh, PV watts um, with all the losses, you come up just about where you want to be. And you just want to be a little bit under what you, you actually produce. Because anything that you produce um, that doesn't get used in 12 months, CMP doesn't, they keep it for free. You don't get the, you lose the credits. So, so in, in terms of uh, PV, making a decision, are you saving money versus saving energy? What, what's your reason for doing it? Um, I know there's high upfront costs. Um, Efficiency Maine how it has, they used to have a PACE loan, but they have a power main loan. They change their programs on a regular basis, but they're about 4.99% for 15 years. 
So even if you go through or get an equity loan on your home, um, if you finance it over the, a period of so many years, the amount that you're spending on your loan is going to be about the same that you're going to be spending on electricity anyway. So it's not going to change your bottom line of your, your monthly budget too much. You, depending upon the situation, it might be instead of $80 a month for electricity, your loan payment might be $100. But it's not, it's not going to change your bottom line for very, very much. Um, one of the things that's huge right now is the federal uh, tax incentives. Uh, right now it's 30% until 2019, uh, 2019, and it will be reducing to 10% in 2021. For residential, this typical payback is 9 to 12 years. Um, that can get better as panels and modular solar pricing comes down. I can say that um, I, I did a small solar array, one of my first ones, about seven years ago, and a 2,000 watt system ended up being like $9,000 which is like almost $5 a watt installed. Um, so again, pricing has come down quite a bit um, in the last uh, three or four years, significantly. Uh, sure. Uh, can you have like, your roof, like, improve the check? I mean, in other words, you don't want to put it on a roof that's going to have to be replaced in the next five years, right? I mean, that is correct. If you, if you can, and the, the modules can be taken off and put back on, it's just an additional labor cost at that time. Most of the cost of a solar system is not the labor, it's the, it's the cost of the materials. Labor is probably maybe 10, 15, 20 percent of the whole cost. So if you have to take them off to fix the roof, that's not that big of a deal? Yeah, you, you would want to add on at least a few thousand dollars to your roofing project, uh, just to be sure. So, but the best thing to do is if you know you're going to need to replace your roof in a few years, you might as well do it now. And then you, it'll help protect the roof, but if you've got a leaky roof to start off with, don't think solar panels are going to fix your leaky roof because it'll still drip between the panels. It's not a tight sort of connection. Um, the other thing that people don't think about is, you know, if I've got $10,000, let me put it in the stock market and I'll make, you know, some money on that. Let's just say it doubles in value in, in 10 years. Um, a doubled value, you're going to be ta paying taxes on that $10,000 um, income. Any savings over the course of years will never be taxed because you don't tax money you don't really spend, if that makes sense. So if you're trying to say, well, I'd rather, I'll make more money in the stock market, but just realize that that money would be tax-free if you save the equivalent amount of money in electricity. So that's one thing to consider. Uh, and again, projected lifetimes of modules are 25 to 35 years. Uh, modules themselves are guaranteed for production of 80% of their rated value for 25 years. So if you've got a module that says it's going to produce 100 watts, um, in 25 years it's guaranteed to be at least 80 watts at that point. Uh, and inverters, for the most part, um, they'll probably have to be replaced once or twice in the course of 25 to 35 years. And again, the price of those, price of inverters are probably these days a couple thousand dollars. So in technology, 10 years from now, when you're replacing it, it's probably going to be cheaper than that. Yes? Could we say that the seller is a, is a sure thing to the investment? Is there anything that could go wrong between now and 20 years from now that could affect your return on your investment? Aside from if, you're, if you take a loan and you're paying interest on the loan, that's going to reduce your return on investment. So interest on the loan. Um, if a tree falls, you know, this, the panels are, are designed to withstand like golf ball sized hailstones. They're really pretty resilient. You, I could stand on them um, and they're not going to break. I sometimes have to crawl around panels to do things on occasion. What about with net metering? I think I heard it was in the bottom or something where they just did away with it, I think. So suddenly you're not getting that is extra energy and suddenly you're paying for electricity and that value. Yes, that's, that's, that is another, another thing that, um, depending upon politics and, 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 and philosophies of our elected officials on whether they support or don't support solar um, or any other sort of renewables. Uh, net metering is something which is very, very important, at least this, from my perspective, in this stage of the development and uh, blossoming of the solar industry. Um, right now, um, the state of Maine probably has about 1% of all the electricity is coming from solar. And 
the Public Utilities Commission uh, basically said when we get to 1%, that metering is going to go away. So we're kind of at that point, and there's lots of discussion. Um, as soon as net metering goes away, um, it changes significantly um, the payback period. Because if you're not allowed to get the credits to CMP, that you send to CMP, then that means you are not going to be able to get that payback as much. So right now, in the state of Maine, it is grandfathered forever if you get it installed by the end of the year. This year. This year. After next, it goes down 10% for the next 15 years. So next year it'll only be 90%. The year after that it'll be 80 something percent. And the year after, until after 15 years, it's down to nothing. Um, so the question is, I, I don't necessarily disagree with that, the, with the philosophy that net metering is really not sustainable. You can't have. You're using the, the grid as a, essentially a free battery. It costs you $12 a month versus buying a battery bank, which is going to cost you $10,000. Okay, so the feeling is if you can, well, you can't have, let's just say 50% of the homes in the, in the state of Maine had solar. That means the other 50% of the homes are actually maintaining the grid. And that's really not fair. I, I don't disagree with, uh, with our current administration about that. My, my point is what is the appropriate percentage where net metering should go away? It shouldn't be, um, from my perspective and talking to other people, it should be someplace between 5 and 15%. Because, you know, you still have to maintain the lines when the power goes out. Even when, at nighttime, you're still dependent upon the grid um, on snowstorms and, and weeks without, you know, if your panels are covered for a significant amount of time. So there was one month in, three years ago, at one of my sites, the, the roof was completely covered with snow for almost a month produced almost nothing, and it was because it was so cold. Usually, it'll warm up and the, and the snow will just slide right off the modules. Um, but in this particular month, it was, it was like, I think the winter of 2015 in February, it was like a cold spell. Usually a snowstorm, and then it warms up to like 30, 45 degrees, and everything slides off, and you're good to go, and you, you're cleaned off again. Um, but those things can happen. And you're still dependent upon the grid. So the grid still has to be there, even for those um, who have solar when there's no power available. So it's a legitimate uh, concern. It's just a matter of, at this point, again, my opinion, at this point, uh, for the solar industry, needs that boost, and so prices can come down even further to make it more affordable, where um, sooner or later, batteries will be cheap enough to be able to install those. And again, hydrogen is another way of storing energy. Um, we can talk about that a little bit later if you're interested. Um, so net metering is, is something we could talk about for hours, and, and there's lots of conversations going on in the state. The state has had a couple bills to kind of preserve it. Uh, both of them uh, were approved by our state legislatures, both vetoed by uh, um, the governor, and then they missed the override by like two votes both times in 2016. But getting back to the, the federal tax credits, this is the schedule for uh, the federal tax credit going down from, in 2020 to 26%, 2021, 22%, and then in 2022 it goes away completely, um, except for 10% for commercial. So if you're gonna be putting in a solar system, you should be really thinking about doing it at least before 2021. Okay. Um, we're just talking about um, net metering. Well, what's the alternative net metering? Well, putting in a battery bank system, uh, being completely off grid. Um, there are other components that are required in an uh, off-grid system, one of them being batteries, which is probably the most expensive piece. Um, so we've got the solar panels, we've got the inverters and other components, but we also have combiner boxes to bring strings together because voltage is a lot smaller. Uh, I, could, I, I don't need to get into the technical piece of that, but um, here's a typical grid-tied system where you have your panels, you've got your inverter, you've got your um, um, service panel, and then you get the grid. In a battery-based system that's purely off-grid, you've got the panels, it goes to a combiner, it goes to a switch, it goes to a charge controller, which basically maintains, it's like a voltage regulator. If you, most cars have those to make sure your battery stays charged. Um, pumps that electricity in the battery, and then from the battery you um, have the inverter, which transfers it to the AC. So there's just a couple extra components, but the expense really comes in, in enough batteries to take care of all your needs. 
This is actually, um, and this is a, a situation where it makes more sense to be off grid. This is up in Cornish, where um, um, a couple purchased 100 acres in Cornish on top of a mountain, and to run CMP almost a, almost a, probably three quarters of a mile to the top was going to be like forty thousand dollars. Well, spend the money on the batteries, but at the same time, um, you know, be frugal in, in, in what you need. And they're, they're, this is just the house for the battery bank, and as they're getting set up to build their house, they built a small cottage. And for the most part, these panels, which is only around 2,000 watts, is taking care of all their lighting, refrigeration, um, and some basic, basic needs. Uh, and there was one time I got a phone call in the middle of December saying, the batteries are, are dead. I said, well, we haven't had any, it was that cold, cold summer, <laughs> winter. We haven't had enough sun for those batteries to recharge. So in that situation, you either have a spare generator to charge up the batteries, you're good for another couple of days. This battery bank was good for probably about two to three days of their use with zero sun at all, or completely covered by snow. But even if the snow is gone, it's still not producing that much. You saw in that, the, the, the figures from the um, library, I think today it was only like, you know, we had up to 50 kilowatt hours in a day on a sunny day last week. This morning, I think it was only like two kilowatt hours. So even on a cloudy day, it's not producing what it could be um, from that perspective. And here's the inverter, here's the charge controller, here's the battery bank in that particular system. Um, so things you want to start thinking about if you're t talking about putting in, in, in a solar system for your home is your site evaluation. Do you have a good southern exposure? Do you have a lot of trees? If you're not going to be willing to cut trees, I'm not an advocate. I was a botany major, so I don't like to cut trees. Um, you don't want to, um, you know, shading could be an issue. Uh, the roof angle. If, you're, if you have a good roof angle, you can still produce power like the library is, the modules are only at 10 degrees. Those will still produce power, but probably maybe a thousand kilowatt hours less power in the course of a year, just because they don't have optimum orientation to the sun. Um, your roof dimensions. How many panels can you get up on that roof? Um, so basically you want to look at your, your CMP bill to figure out how much you need and, and then kind of make those um, all the calculations to figure out what's um, happening. I talked about fixed versus tracking systems. Tracking systems I really wouldn't spend money on. Uh, I would just take the extra money and you'd save money uh, by just putting in more panels than putting in a tracking system. Um, so this is a great example of uh, um, a, the couple in 2013 built this 1,700 square foot salt box. Again, and, and I want to go beyond the solar stuff because we're talking about sustainability. When you're building a brand new house, there are so many smart things that can be done these days. And I kind of pointed them in different directions. Before you even start thinking about solar panels, number one is insulation. Do a good job in insulation. Number two, pick a heating system. And the most efficient heating systems in this state is going to be geothermal. Um, the next most efficient is going to be air source heat pumps. Um, there's a huge difference in cost, um, and we can talk about that later if you'd like. But so number one, um, insulations, really spend the money on weatherization. Number two, um, geothermal. And then number three, I said live in the house for a year and then figure out how much power you need. And then we designed a system. As it turns out, they didn't have enough roof space for 100%. This system was doing about 80% of their value. And their annual energy cost for their entire house, for heat, hot water, air conditioning, electricity, $850. And again, the things that I had recommended is basement foundation, ICF. So long as your basement is insulated, ICF are basically two inches of foam on the inside, two inches of foam on the outside, and they fill in cement in between. They're like Lego blocks that go together. Um, but they're really, really good uh, in, in efficiency. Uh, meticulous weatherization. Make sure all the gaps are closed. Um, make sure you don't have, um, have a good insulation and contractor that's really knowledgeable about making sure things are sealed up tight. Dense pack cellulose insulation. I do not ever recommend using fiberglass insulation these days. There are so much more superior products out there, especially if you're building new. A little bit more expensive than, than fiberglass, um, but you're not going to get the performance you would out of dense pack cellulose um, or rock sole. Um, foam is another really good insulating um, product. Um, I'm not a big fan of foam just because you can't do anything in the walls ever again, and during fires it can have really bad 
smoke inhalation sort of toxic chemicals when the foam starts to burn. Uh, but it's a great insulator. I, I'm not going to say that. Uh, geothermal heating and air conditioning. Um, and as you look here, their electricity cost, just the electricity cost was all the heat, air conditioning, and electricity needs, $363 for 2015. They spent more money heating their hot water than they did heating their house and using all the electricity. Okay. If they could have um, put more modules up here, they would have been up to 100%. They've since changed to a heat pump water heater, so the electricity is going to be higher. They also bought an electric car. So if they could put more solar panels up, um, they would definitely do so to kind of make themselves completely net, net zero. Uh, which brings me to the next topic, which is community solar. I've talked to this owner saying, hey, if I ever do any community solar projects, they want a piece of it. And has anybody heard of community solar before? That is, is really a fantastic way of moving forward. Um, not everybody can install solar. If you live in an apartment in Portland, you can't really install solar in your apartment. You don't know the building. Um, if you're a condo owner, same sort of thing. Or if you're in a neighborhood that just is just too cramped and too many trees or whatever. Um, roof obstructions, buildings, whatever. First, So there are situations where some people can just never put up solar. So community solar is something where um, up to nine different uh, people, or CMP meters, so nine, let's just say there's ten people in the room here. I can be one of them and nine people out there. We can all put in together for one solar system. And when, if I've got like a ten acres of land and I can easily put up a um, hundred modules, you can buy 10% 10, 10 of it, you can buy 30% of it, you can buy 15% of it, whatever. You share the cost in terms of building this whole system. And from the net metering perspective, and this is my understanding is with the community solar, since you're building a solar array, the only way of getting it to your home is through the grid. And to my understanding, net metering is not affecting community solar at this point. Um, so from that perspective, um, the, one, the couple rules is one of the owner has to have the, the solar array on their property. And the other is everybody in the, in the organization has to be on the same utility, whether it's all CMP, Bangor Hydro, or whatever it happens to be. They're going to be more expensive because you're actually leasing some people's land. You know, that's going to be part of it. So you might see a little bit greater expense. So community solar is an answer for lots of different uh, places. And there's actually more. I've talked to my legislator, uh, representative of my town, who is, um, he wants to see if, if, if any sort of net metering stuff is going to happen. He wants it to be the most efficient as possible. And these community solar systems are ones that can do so. Um, I'm just going to shift over to just a couple other things that I do. I started this program called Solar Outreach for Schools, which is basically a mobile solar trailer that's designed to uh, bring a solar trailer to a school, work with the math and science teachers to teach students. Again, we're talking about uh, the generational sort of gap. Um, and part of it is to really let students understand that um, in order to design a solar system, you need to know math and science and physics. So you're working with the physics teachers, the math teachers, and, and really teaching them all the things about the different components. Once the classroom work is done, you take them outside. They assemble the whole uh, trailer. You leave the trailer there, power up a battery bank, which it's, again, a grid-free system, and then use the power for a school event. Once it's done, pack it all up and bring it to another school. Um, my goal is to have students at one school who've learned it to be the teachers at the next school. Again, this is still early in its infancy. Uh, this was the solar trailer at the Portland Green Fest about a month ago. This is actually its debut. Been working on this for quite a few years. I started with a pilot project at Casco Bay High School probably about seven or eight years ago. Um, and here's where we have the students actually putting this thing together. Um, this is, we left it in the parking lot for a couple days at the end of the week. Uh, they had a school assembly and they used the power from the school assembly for uh, powering their projectors, powering their music, powering everything else. But it could be used for a lot of other things. Uh, this is the construction in the earlier days, getting painted up, cleaned up a little bit more. And here are all the components I talked about before, the charge controllers, the switch boxes, the combiners, and the inverters. Um, so the last couple of slides is, as, as citizens, we have choices. Um, but we don't have all the choices that we might like to have. Um, 
But our choices that we make, and sometimes we have to spend a little bit more money to do so, can in start influencing changes to, to the way things work. And this is where um, the generational gap will change as um, kids of today just think of solar. Well, why wouldn't you be doing solar and other renewables? Um, we don't always have a choice where our electricity comes from. Uh, again, we used to have uh, Maine Yankee. So we had no choice about getting power that came from a nuclear power plant. Although you might think nuclear power is, might be better than global warming. You're not getting the same, you have different sort of environmental risk, one versus the other. Oil, natural gas, coal, these are all um, different types of fossil, uh, fossil fuels. Um, we're virtually dependent upon fossil fuels for transportation, except in subway systems that could perhaps be set up to a, an electrical grid uh, that's being powered by renewables. Uh, consumer demand is a force for change. Um, being an active citizen who is promoting some of the things that um, can help our, our renewable energy um, efforts to make things cleaner and better as we move forward. Um, just as a list for the fossil fuels, oil, natural gas, propane, coal, nuclear, renewables, um, these are still combustible. Uh, pellets, wood, corn, ethanol, those are all combustible products, but they're still renewable, so there's a, a carbon neutral effect to uh, using that. Um, then the solar-based renewables, which is solar electricity, solar heat, either passive or through um, different sorts of um, um, thermal, thermal uh, tubing. Uh, wind, those are all based on uh, solar and the sun. And then hydroelectric, hydroelectric, whether it's a dam, tidal, or wave. Um, typical windmill, this is a different type of windmill called uh, vertical wind, which has a big magnet underneath here which supports the weight of that. Um, so you can do it in places where it's less obtrusive, but they're not as productive. Again, hydroelectric power uh, or, or hydropower from the earlier days with wagon, uh, water wheels to big dams. Again, this is just a means of storing energy by utilizing water in a higher potential energy. Um, radiant heat through these evacuated solar tubes um, that can heat your hot water to as hot as you need it to be. You just need to have enough tubes for your amount of consumption. Uh, in the Midwest or um, in the desert states, they've got these uh, parabolic uh, structures which are concentrating the heat on this tube in the middle, which gets up to, it's not water, it's some sort of brine solution, it gets up to six, 700 degrees that can spin turbines, um, tracks the sun, um, very, very effective uh, for, again, large scale um, electricity production. This is one of my biggest jobs at, at uh, Days Inn in South Portland. This, um, Hotel has 417 modules on it, and it's 123 kW, uh, so 123,000 watts. And this hotel, actually, there's actually another 153 on the other side of the building. Um, it's, only, it's only actually, this whole system is only doing about a third of their energy consumption. But it's significant. And when you start putting solar up with commercial entities, not only do they get the tax credits, they get the... Um, um, they also get to depreciate. So paybacks for a commercial uh, situation like this is usually anywhere between five and seven years. And we start having um, large solar farms like this, um, those will start making some big differences as we move forward. Some of my other projects, um, this is a, a 1971 Volkswagen Bug that I'm converting to an electric. Uh, here you can see where the gas tank was, there are three batteries. Uh, this is actually um, a, a uh, transformer, which is you plug in, you actually plug in a cord there and it turns on this charger which charges three batteries there. There are actually also nine more batteries in the back seat. Um, the motor's been taken out and been replaced with electric motor with um, some of the different controllers that um, take the battery power and transition it into um, electric power. This, when fully charged, I, I'm embarrassed to say I've been working on this for several years, it's not quite done yet but uh, probably would be able to, on a full charge, be able to go about 80 miles. And um, to convert something, to convert a car right now, the equipment was around $8,000. So a lot cheaper than a Tesla or even the Chevy Volt if you've got the, the wherewithal to figure it out. That's it for me. I could go on forever about lots of different things, but. Can I ask you guys a question? Is there anyone in the room who's considering solar and that's why you're here? Few, would you have anyone like to mention, was this helpful? Did you learn anything or any ins and outs that maybe influence your decision? 
that was definitely help, helpful for me. I, I didn't know, didn't have any idea how much a system might cost. So that was helpful. And uh, there's lots of other uh, issues about that catering and uh, versus kind of an off grid system. Uh, but I'm also curious uh, if you designed a system for, you, you mentioned the house where uh, the, the people who own it now have an electric car, but have you designed a system for people who, who are electric car owners and who wish to take advantage of to you know, try to power their car with solar and would you have to have a battery to store some of that energy to power your car, <laughs> a whole battery? Well, yeah, if you're, if you're charging it during the day, it's easy, but your car is likely not going to be at the house during that day. So um, with the, if you're connected to the CMP anyway, you know, if you're, going to be, if you're going to be on grid, there's not a problem in charging your car at night. In order to be net zero, you just need to build a bigger system. Like I said, this, this, this family um, was 80% with 6,000 watts on their roof. And they've started adding the heat pump water heater, which is, again, they went from natural gas, uh, propane to that, and they're plugging in their car now. So they're, I don't know what their consumption is now, but it's probably at least another 25 to 30, 40% more than it was when they first moved into the house. So they would just have to upsize their system. You know, if they had more space on the roof, it's just a matter of putting up enough modules in order to make up that difference. And if they can't, which they do not have uh, enough space on the roof, you know, the f I haven't done a community solo yet. I've got a potential site right now that I'm speaking with the owners. They definitely want to have a piece of it um, because they want to be able to be net zero. And then another nice thing about community solar is if you move from one place to another, you just change your credits to a different um, meter. So it's not something you're, you're tied to. So you could live in the apartment in Portland this week and move to another apartment next week and still be able to swap that power to a different meter. How would a uh, consumer go about finding a community solar opportunity? Um, I would say I'm not doing it yet. I, it's the niche market that I'd like to be able to get into. I just need to get my feet wet, but you could reach out to other solar installers out there. Definitely. Yeah. If you didn't have enough room on your roof, could you put some, and you had land, no trees around, could you just put some extra panels on some kind of, I don't know, something that would hold them right in the ground? Yeah, a ground mount system. Um, I actually was just up at Rangeley about a, three weeks ago, a uh, huge house but it had dormers everywhere, and it wasn't quite well situated towards the south, and where it was south, there were trees. Uh, so I said, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense to be putting like two or three panels here around dormers, but behind the driveway, there's a nice area that's unobstructed, facing south, that you could put in a ground mount system there. It would probably be much more, you'd get twice as much energy out of it because it's gonna have better exposure. So yes, ground mounts are, are well, very appropriate. They just cost a little bit. The, the, the information you gave uh, is pretty, so a very pretty good model. But all I've got to do is go home and look at my bills and plug in the numbers. So thank you for, for that. Yeah, and anybody, again, regardless if you get solar or you work with me or anybody else, I'm not here to pump my business. I'm here to answer questions. So anybody who has any questions, if you want to reach out to me one way or the other, whether you decide to do solar or not, I'm happy to, again, part of my, my existence is to encourage people to move forward in a positive and green direction. Can you speak about geothermal and how a homeowner would go about bringing that into their energy portfolio? Does anybody know what geothermal is? Okay, basically what geo, do you know what heat pumps are? You know the heat pumps that are, are appearing on people's homes all the time? There's like a $500 incentive from Efficiency Maine right now. Oh, you're worth explaining if you can't read what they do. Yeah, basically ba what a heat pump does is it takes air 
which is outside, or a better way of explaining it, the, uh, the best example of a heat pump is your refrigerator. Because you have a compressor on the back of the refrigerator, which is, as it's compressing, it's taking heat out of the inside of the refrigerator and it's dissipating. You know how your refrigerator is warm in the back? That's exactly what a heat pump is that's on the side of somebody's house. But instead of taking cold air out of the refrigerator, it's taking warm air out of the outside air. And then your heat pump is the, the, the thing on the back of the refrigerator that you're capturing and filling into your house. That's kind of, it's, it's basically HVAC compression technology, which has been around for a long, long time. So there's a difference between, um, the difference between heat pumps that are on the outside of the house versus geothermal. It's the same principle. What you have on the outside of the house is, let's just say, it's 50 degrees outside. So it's going to suck 50 degree air outside, take like 10 degrees of heat out of it, and put that extra 10 degrees in your house. And when it spits out the air, it's going to be like maybe, instead of 50 degrees, 40 degrees. So it's extracting heat from the air. Well, you can imagine at 50 degrees, it's going to be pretty efficient. But as it gets closer and closer to zero degrees, it gets less and less efficient because it has less heat to work with. And there's a concept called coefficient of performance. It's called COP. It means for every unit of energy you put in, how many units of energy you get out. And the COP for using electric heat is one to one. You put electricity into a heating element, and you get 100% of it back. The coefficient of performance for oil, even with the best oil boilers, is 0.85 or 0.9 to one. Because some of the heat is always going up the chimney. You know, some of the more efficient ones are in the 90s right now uh, for some natural gas units. Um, so when you're dealing with the heat pumps on the outside of people's homes that's using the outside air, your COP at, is around 3 to 1, 3.5 to 1 at 50 degrees. But as it gets closer and closer and closer to 0 degrees, it goes down to like 1 to 1. And then at some point, if it gets so cold, you need to have a backup system for that. For geothermal systems, what you're using instead of that outside air, you're using water coming out of the ground, which is 50 degrees year-round. So even if, and, and geothermal systems usually have a COP of 4 to 1. So even on a zero degree day, you're still taking water up out of the ground at 50 degrees, extracting the temperature out, and when it goes back out of the machine, it's down to 42 degrees. So you've extracted like six degrees of temperature out. It is much more efficient moving heat than creating it with electricity, gas, oil, or other sort of fuels. Does that make sense? Geothermal systems um, get expensive, much more expensive, um, mostly because you need to have a well, um, because that's where the water is coming from. So if, if you have, I'm trying to make this quick and simple. Um, basically, if you've got a, a, a heat pump that does, it's called uh, BTUs, and if it's like um, a four ton, or 4,000 BTUs furnace, it's, it's putting out so much heat based on that. For every ton, you need three gallons of water per minute, gallons per minute. So if you have a four ton unit, you need to have a well that can put out 12 gallons a minute, okay? So if you've got a well that puts out 50 gallons a minute, like the house that I showed you in, 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 um, uh, that's very, very efficient, their well was putting out 50 gallons a minute. So I had no problem at all. Um, and the, you know, it doesn't even have to be that deep. I have geothermal in my house. I had existing wells that were doing 18 gallons a minute, and all I needed for my five-ton unit was, actually it was two gallons a minute because, well, let's just say it's three gallons a minute. I still have an extra three gallons a minute for my domestic water use. If I put in a two-ton unit, which a small house would probably, that's all they'd need, they'd need four gallons a minute, or eight gallons, or six. Does that help? Again, it's, it, go ahead. So, so it's not too expensive if you have a well already or if you're going to install a well because you're not on public water. Right? If, you're not, if you're on public water, then it becomes less attractive because you have to install a well. Correct. Um, I put in the system in my house. I had 18 gallons a minute. Um, my well was only 100 feet deep. 
and it cost me $14,000 for the installation of the geothermal pump and another $3,000 to put in um, a better pump, a more efficient pump. And that was put in about eight years ago and my heating cost would have been about $3,000 a month and it's gone down to like maybe $1,000 a month, $1,200 a month. So my payback plus it was, at the time it was getting the 30% tax credit. So my, let's just say $18,000, I get $6,000 back in the tax credit the first year. So I have payback of $12,000 over the course of six years. The $2,000 a year is paid for itself. What I need to do is have enough. Tax credits just ran out for geothermal this year. A common theme tonight is that the juicy things running out. And I know, I believe efficiency means some of those benefits are, are potentially running out in the near, nearish future. Uh, that's correct. Um, efficiency Maine just in 2016 had a $5,000 rebate for geothermal. So my $15,000 or $18,000 system would have only cost me $5,000 <laughs> you know, after tax credit and rebate. So it makes it much more even playing field. But now they're down to $3,000 and the federal isn't doing it anymore. Do you think in your crystal ball that the other factors will balance out for the loss of those incentives in terms of price dropping for solar panels or something like that? As technology gets cheaper, as solar panels get cheaper, there's probably, that's when at least the tax credit should run out. Again, I think uh, the incentives are there to get people and the industry up and running from a federal government perspective. And once it's up and running, and if you can get, you know, if it cost $20,000 10 years ago to do a solar system, and it brings it down to $12,000 after the tax credit, well, if you can buy 10 years later the same system for $12,000, you're getting it kind of for the same price anyway. And that's one of the good things about incentives, it makes it, so it's volume driven as opposed to um, specialty driven. Yes. I live in a big apartment building, um, 96 units I think, and I was thinking of maybe persuading the landlord to switch from natural gas to solar because we have a clear view on the roof of any direction. So is there a site that I can point them to, to maybe do some persuading? Because they're very economically um, persuaded. Um, one thing about solar, and I'm, it, it's not usually the best source for creating heat unless you're attached to geothermal or something like that. Um, how, again, natural gas is the heating system, I assume. So they'd have to change their heating system to something that electricity could power. So it's not just changing the, um, putting solar power up for the natural, or for the heating perspective. Right, the heat is hot water baseboard. Yeah, so at this point, for solar thermal, would be a way of, of maximizing the sun to, to create heat. Um, but at this point, the costs of solar thermal are so, you'd need such a huge system. Um, it's, it's pretty much cost prohibitive at this point. Um, so I would recommend to be able to offset a lot of electricity by utilizing solar if you've got a big wide open roof. Um, but from a perspective of there's so much more infrastructure that I have to change in that apartment complex from heating systems and, um, you know, geothermal, if you were to go in that direction, uh, would also, it works best with forced hot air and not baseboard or hot water. Um, so it's not necessarily the best fit for a change. Um, the thing that could be done is to change over to maybe the heat pumps, the air source heat pumps on the outside of the buildings. Um, for each unit, but then again, in an apartment complex, that's complicated too. Yeah. But I will say that um, at the hotels I've been working at, uh, the hotel owner is very, very energy conscious and he's changing, you know, the, like the air conditioning units you often see in, and heating units in hotels. Well, those are now becoming much more efficient, like heat pump 
sorts of heating and air conditioning. So they're much more efficient than they were maybe five or ten years ago. And he's swapping them all out to be able to emphasize that. So in a situation where you started, if you could change all your apartments to like these kind of wall units that just stick outside, that's a way of utilizing electricity where you get their better coefficient of performance of a three to one uh, for outside source heat pumps. And then you keep your regular natural gas for backup on those really cold nights. Does that make sense? Yeah. In terms of the sustainability aspect of all this, I mean, if you can't afford to do the solar stuff, I mean, the energy audit for your home, is that a good way to go? I mean, is that something that you can cost effectively in terms of back to the buck until you get to a point where you're going to the solar system? Absolutely. Before you do anything with solar, you should be tightening up your house. Um, I was a certified energy auditor. Um, my certification ran out. I've got the equipment to do it, but I, I'm not certified at least to get um, to do that. I can still do them, but I, my name doesn't mean anything to Efficiency Maine where you can get rebates. You need to have a certified energy audit to get some of the rebates from Efficiency Maine. So if you put in, um, you want to spend as much money on insulating your house before you do anything with solar. Absolutely. And Efficiency Maine, at least last I knew, if you spend $2,100 on energy improvements, they will reimburse you around, uh, I think, $1,200 or $1,300. Um, it starts off, and, and their programs change all the time. I've kind of lost track, but you know, minimum, if you put in two hundred dollars, you get four hundred dollars, um, and there are different tiers of what you can do. But I just did this in my house, and the, um, the insulation company went with paid the cost for the energy of it as part of their package. And I also found a huge difference too. Like I had about four or five different people look at the house, and they all said something different, and they had very different price ranges. Um, so the last guy I remember that not only the best price, but he was the only one who noticed everything that all the others had seen. And his take on what the house needed incorporated all of their ideas. So it was really a wide range. One guy was like, it's all about this, it's all about that, it's all about the other thing. And had I gotten either one of those, I would have had a third of the puzzle. So the, the, the final guy who got the job, had, without me telling him, incorporated all of those and noticed all of those things. Um, but, so I would shop around, but, uh, Rocky's right, I mean, it makes a huge difference in terms of um, insulation, changing light bulbs, stuff like that. Uh, Efficiency Main website has great videos about it. They go through a few case studies um, of people, so you might find a home like yours with similar problems, um, and they show what they found and what the solution was and what the savings were. But in, in a lot of cases, the savings from just tightening up the insulation are, are dramatic. Um, and definitely a good place to start before worrying about um, providing for your energy costs to, to renewables. Money saved. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100% there. Um, the places where, and if you have an official an energy audit, depending upon who's doing it, it's going to be anywhere between probably $300 and $500. Um, but it's well, money well, if you get a good auditor, it's money well spent because you know where exactly to concentrate your, your dollars. And for the most part, the places to concentrate your dollars is weatherization, and there's something called the stack effect. You know how a chimney just draws heat up the chimney? Well, your house is like a big chimney. If you've got leaky basement, cracked windows and things like that in the basement, not insulated rim joists around the basement, you've got a, your, your stink pipe that goes from the basement all the way to the roof, or a chimney that's got a space around it, you're just sucking air all the way up to the roof, and it's not even touching the house. So the first places you spend money in terms of insulation, if your insulation budget is tight, is number one, attic. Cl close any sort of gaps from stink pipes around chimneys, and there are proper ways of doing it. You can't just put foam around a chimney. You have to put a little metal. This will be two inches of non-combustible next to a chimney. So you put metal around it, then you use fire-rated caulking to, to seal that. And that prevents air from going right up the, right up, right up the middle of the house. Uh, I had one audit I did in Wyndham where they had a bathroom fan that was, <laughs> it was just exiting into the attic. So basically heat from the house was, when I did the blower door test, heat was just going right up through the bath bathroom fan into the attic and outside. And that's actually even a bigger problem because you have moist air from a bathroom fan going into an attic which is cold and it starts to condense and you can start having mold and mildew problems. 
There are a lot of things. But spend money in the attic first, basement second. Um, windows are probably the last thing to do. It's like 30-year paybacks for most windows. And you know, you get a good window, you get a bad window, and it's like an R1. You get a really good window, it's like an R3. <laughs> you know, you might as well put in an R39 up in your attic and seal all those gaps before you do anything else. But windows are the last thing to do. And even the walls on the side of the buildings are probably, I do those before the windows, and if the windows are really, really bad, you can do that as well. But um, I live in a house built in the 1700s, so I've got plaster walls. I'm not, you know, I'm going to do my insulation when I reside the house. I'll take the boards off and I'll do it from the outside. 